The truth is one of the central aspects of all human philosophy from the most ancient of days upon old earth. The Greekans, the Romani, the Afric, the Britanniae, the Orion, all cultures filled vast librariums of works upon its nature. Theses upon theses about truth, or on truth, or concerning truth. It forms, in and of itself, a myriad of different frameworks impossible to collate, for many oppose one another upon absolutely fundamental principles. What is the nature of truth? How can one identify truth? Is truth all that is, or is it an impossible ideal, since all that is is ultimately subjective, a barely coherent macrostructure of generally agreed upon concepts that we have come to term the universe we inhabit? None of these ancient societies have ever concluded as to what their own truth has been, relegating it instead to the halls of universariums, collegiates, for people of learning to discuss and debate and discourse upon, to no ultimate conclusion. For what should such conclusion matter? They were debating the ephemeral, unknowable concepts of the universe. There was no need to arrive at a decision. The exercise in and of itself was the point, the examination of the human condition, not arriving at a deduction upon the nature of humanity's place within reality. <laughs> Simple, ignorant times. We of the present era know that. What would these philosophants and rhetoricians think if they saw the necessity of a truth such as we possess today? Would it have broken their minds to know that conviction is a matter of survival? That your existence is dependent upon the truth and that, finally, society had at one glorious point arrived upon a single instance of it, only for it to be torn down in the most terrible of infernos. One man decided upon this actuality, and he sought to bend an entire species upon its axis, and all, oh, to dread ruin. Know then that this is a record of the most total philosophical framework ever devised by the hand of humanity, and the greatest lie in our history, the imperial truth. The imperial truth was a name given to the emperor's atheistic philosophy that underpinned the entirety of the Imperium, from its birth upon Terra during the Unification Wars, through the Great Crusade, and even into the fires of the Horus Heresy. It was a system of values that held, ultimately, that the universe was a rational place. Purely rational. That there were no such things as gods, demons, or the supernatural and that anything that appeared to be the latter was, ultimately, an aspect of universal science we had yet to unlock and explain. Thus, it was no mere assertion that knowledge and learning was the way of things. It was a direct repudiation of the esoteric, the religious, and the irrational. Principles beyond the known were not to be wondered at with anything akin to superstition. They were to be researched by those most intelligent and qualified, or to be dismissed as simply an aspect of reality to be discovered and investigated at a later date. There was no room for religion, or even faith itself, under the Emperor's truth and within his now godless realm. In fact, they were to be actively and, if necessary, violently destroyed, for the Age of Strife had been a period of human history where the ability of the human mind to be cowed by systems of faith was recklessly and greedily exploited. Religions, cults, and sects beyond counting had risen and fallen and risen again as a strife-beset humanity had torn itself to shreds. All promising answers, redemption, or simply just power to those who would prostrate themselves before whatever idol was placed upon the pulpit. Old Night was an age of the demagogue, the prophet, and the false messiah, so much so that we have lost even the ability to record them all. The imperial truth was a direct response, in so many ways, to this darkest of chapters in humanity's history. 
As the nascent Imperium spread the word of unity before it, it did so with the harshest of repudiations for these false religions. The lies of the past were to be torched upon pyres taller than the cathedrals raised to venerate them. Believers unwilling to renounce their faith, clinging to their ignorance even as the light of the Emperor sought to illuminate them, would suffer the same fate. The Imperial truth was rational and absolute, and in that lay a purity that was the fire needed to fuel the Emperor's regime. Terra of the late M20s was a roiling sea of petty kingdoms, vicious theocracies, and lunatic cults, and through these the blade of a unified atheistic philosophy cut straight and true. It was not simply a case of the truth being better than others. It was emancipating in its transparency. There was nothing to be gained, essentially, by a man clad in gold telling you there were no gods of his to worship, no demons he could protect you from, no soul of yours he could save. His philosophy was one concerned with the mundane and everyday, the reality you yourself could see and shape and affect. Why should the heaving populaces of Terra spend their brief existences terrified of the fate of their supernatural, eternal selves, forever giving all they could, body and mind, to this priest or that, depending on who was standing before them? So easily exploited is the human mind, so quickly turned to fretting over that which it cannot possibly comprehend or control, so deliciously ripe for honeyed promises of safety and salvation. For tens of thousands of years, the yoke of religion had damned the species to war, murder, bigotry, destruction, and deepest, purest ignorance. It sought to fill all the gaps in the human condition with the ineffable. When astromancers of ages past questioned why the sun moves around the sky, the priests called it the work of a god in his chariot. When children asked what will happen should they die, the priests tormented them with promises of eternal damnation in a chthonic underworld unless they do precisely as the priests bade them. When those who differed from what the priests demanded all humans should be, who stood up and said, I am equal to you, I am a human, the priests had their followers torture and murder them for the sins of their mere existence. Questions were not to be asked of the world, or even of one's place in it, only of what one can do to pay homage to the god one was told to believe in. Religion was to many a panacea of the mind, those fretful of their own existence, buttresses for the intellect to those whom society or economics had denied the liberation of education. To others, it was a means through which they could exercise a total, unassailable control over not just the lives of their fellow humans, but their minds too. With the ephemeral behind them, the churches and the priests were free to perpetrate all manner of horror and abuse upon their folk, physical and emotional. Predatory, rapacious things, gleefully did they sup upon the powers so readily handed to them by the willing and the terrified. The religious thought permeated the human psyche at the most fundamental level, twisting good people into monsters, hijacking those who desired to do right by their fellow humanity, and turning their decent intentions into twisted parodies of virtue and justice. The Emperor and his imperial truth broke the shackles of the priests, the dependence upon the churches, and placed the fate of humanity solely in its own hands, binding it to the greatest human endeavor ever conceived. Unity. Not just of Terra, but beyond, to the stars themselves. For once the Emperor's unification wars began, humanity would surge forth into the galaxy once more, liberating its long-lost colonies from the yoke of not only the Xenos, but the shackles of faith, too. The foundation of the imperial truth was solid beyond doubt, and with it, humanity achieved true greatness. It did, naturally, come at quite the cost. It is impossible to assay the number of humans who perished upon the pyres of their religions and beliefs, or simply the religions and beliefs of their governments or rulers. Doubtlessly, it runs into the billions. Compliance the formalized system by which a human world was subsumed into the imperial fold, 
stipulated complete adherence to the truth and total renunciation of all forms of faith. Should this be resisted, well, then the skies of that planet were soon to be filled with the drop pods of the Legiones Astartes. Civilizations with direct lineage to old Earth, worlds settled in the first great stellar exodus, those who had previously been humanity's torchbearers to the stars were burned to ash. But while doubtlessly knowledge, history, and traditions of a myriad were lost utterly during these days, the galaxy was routine in providing reminders of why the imperial truth and its renunciation of religion was not only justified, but painfully necessary. In the millennia of the Age of Strife, the occult was king, and even amongst ostensibly civilized human societies, there oft dwelled cankerous beliefs and cults, the adherents to which were often violent, subversive, and uniquely dangerous in their dogmatic hatred of the Emperor's new philosophies. Terrorist atrocities, mass suicides, pacts with Xenos races, nothing was beneath these fanatics, whose actions often provided ample material for imperial iterators to promulgate upon and restate the light that the emperor was bringing to such dark cultures. Iterators were one of the primary means by which the imperial truth was enforced. They were the most visible components of the vast machine that was the imperial civilian propaganda division, but no simple demagogues were they, rather a hybrid of rhetorician, philosopher, and educator. Whether mendicant or embedded within military forces, they were an omnipresent aspect of the Great Crusade, moving amongst populations both newly encountered and long compliant, to strengthen the tenets of the truth and ensure greater cultural alignment with imperial ideals. Recruited from the most quick-witted, educated, and charismatic of imperial civilians, they were to be the bulwark against regression to the dark past, as well as any newly encountered civilization's first point of contact with the Imperium, and the first to tell these people what Imperial systems would mean for them. While in practice, iterators acting as diplomats did deliver whole worlds and systems completely bloodlessly to the Imperium through sheer skill of persuasion, Upon many, many other instances, they were regarded as... Upon many, many other instances, they were regarded by recalcitrant populations as being little more than tools of a tyrant, their words empty bombast, and their promises completely meaningless. In this case, well, the bolters of the Astartes would have to do the work of enlightenment, where speeches had failed. In a dark mirror to the Iterators, there existed the Order Elucidatum. Though appearing nominally as part of the Imperial civilian government, the Order was in fact under the direct control of Malkador the Sigilite, the Emperor's omnipresent right hand, publicly appearing as bureaucrats, but in secret acting as censors of the most ruthless capacity. They were often embedded alongside Iterators, almost entirely without the knowledge of said, in a support capacity, from where they were able to collect data in vast quantities upon the work of iterators and apply it where needed. This could range from everything to directing the type of language an iterator would employ, to providing magenta-level intelligence briefings on cultural touchstones exploitable in military solutions. The sheer quantity of information at the Order's disposal allowed it to shape the very fabric of the Imperial Crusade, identifying common tropes amongst cults separated by hundreds of light years, assessing cultural shock event risk of different first encounter situations, as well as the potential for post-compliance recidivism, all based on data models crunched from tens of thousands of worlds. While all of this was their day-to-day -day purpose, a sort of macro-scale imperial intelligence agency, their underlying purpose was the suppression by means of extreme prejudice, of all faith. To this end, they operated under no formal jurisdiction, being sanctioned to enact whatever means they saw fit by the Sigilites' office itself. Their order and its history was one of blood, murder, and genocide, extreme acts taken under the highest of secrecies in order to eliminate occult sects, secret societies, and fanatical malefactors even those whom society would vest 
quasi-spiritual roles. Shamans, witch doctors, wise women and petty spiritualists. None were below the scrutiny of the elucidators. And, given the span of their careers and the level of data modeling they undertook, they no doubt considered any judgments they made to be supremely well-informed, and based on the most solid of statistical projections. The existence of these secret police were not widely known, and certainly actively discredited by their iterator counterparts. But they did exist, and their terrible actions were not only state-sanctioned, but deemed the necessary, if bloody, cost of the truth's ascendancy. It has been said, in retrospect, that the works of these iterators and remembrancers, elucidators and astartes, ardent celebrants of the truth all, clove to a fanaticism of their own, and this is not without merit. That being said, the Imperium, since its early days, did still to a degree touch upon the irrational and the esoteric, at least in the broadest sense. The necessity of astrotelepathy, for instance, is hardly an exact science, with the only communication method across the gulfs of space being literally oneriomancy, interpretation of dreams. Rituals, such as the practice of oaths of the moment by Astartes legions, yet remained. Secularized, yes, but still redolent in character of sacramental ceremonies ancient beyond reckoning. Call it the trappings of faith, if you will. Mayhap, in his wisdom, the Emperor himself made a concession in this manner, an acknowledgement that our human species is ultimately an emotional one. We feel so deeply, do we humans, creatures so beneath his perfect mind. Perhaps knowing we are not cold cogitators, he allowed the retention of these echoes of the spiritual in order to stimulate and engage the primitive hind brains of his charges. Why else would he name his greatest endeavor a crusade? The following is an excerpt from the essay Truth in All His Works by Alastair Gundy, a rationalist philosopher of Terra and one of the first scholars of the imperial truth, as well as an early contributor to its ideals and place within the imperial system. As an aside from this work on the merits of a single creed of truth, I wish to discredit a popular theory as the foolishness that it is. You see, I scoff at the primitive notion of demons. I attribute these stories of beings of darkest and purest blackest evil to little more than the overblown fear-mongering creations of the tyrants of old earth, dreamed up to keep the basest chattel of mankind suppressed in servitude. The preachings of false prophets, the soothsaying of viziers, and the curses of old hags are but a comical and dramatic methods for the feeble to appear strong, and for the worthless to garner undeserved respect. The trinkets and charms peddled to keep such spirits at bay are little more than mercantile exploitations of salesmen of serpent's oil. All of this, an economy of nonsense, is an exercise in obtaining and maintaining control over the weak-minded. What of the tales of gods and their miracles and retributions? At best, they are simply coincidence attributed to divinity, unexpected hope or despair laid at the feet of certain menacing yet ultimately unextraordinary events. At worst, they are the herd behaviours of group hysteria and mass hallucination, or the spreading of symptoms of mental infirmities caused by the radiological legacy of Terra. The words and deeds of such so-called gods as Magris, Abundance, Dagriel, and Kornatan, and the Contagious King, are patent works of fiction, imagined from the minds of madmen. Nor can they be made to appear from thin air with bubbling incantation, or the scribbled daubing of childlike symbols. Their names hold no power over us, for we are to be a galactic empire of mankind, unified by our enlightenment. Claims that these illogical beings mean us great harm and reside in the turmoil of the warp, too, are falsehoods. The Empyrean is a necessary conduit for space travel, and simply another dimension yet to be fully charted, as all areas of space are. The galaxy is mankind's birthright. The warp falls within our domain, and we shall master it also. Just as the seafarers of old Earth once balked at the depths, and the gas divers of Jupiter avoided the hot jets of the Jovian zones, 
Mankind has, and will again, overcome its irrational, immaterial fears. We learn more of the Xenos forms of the Empyrean with every voyage. They may appear to be drawn towards us, but are simply like shoals of harmless oceanic creatures, attracted by the blinking lights along to the keels of our vessels. As in any ecosystem, there too are predators to be wary of, but these are simply star spawn hunting the shoals, and harbor no malicious intent towards us. I understand that sailors can be a superstitious lot, and so I must reiterate, there are no demons in the warp. This is one of the many reasons why the Imperial Truth is so critical to breaking the fear human minds experience when faced with the vastness of the cosmos. Without it, we could never even leave the light of Sol. There is a lot within this piece of Gundy's work that summarizes the aspects of the Imperial Truth, specifically its early crusade assertions, coherently and indeed bluntly. His disdain for the priests and the peddlers of false truths is paramount in the early paragraphs, rightly decrying the usurpation of humanity's desire for the ephemeral by pernicious systems desiring simply to exploit. He posits the Gestalt story theory common in early truth discourses, namely that superstitions formed as explanations for universal systems, all an aspect of an ignorant humanity, simply attempting to explain and understand the cosmos and their place in it. As the onward march of science and progressivism took hold, the self-same superstitions would simply vanish, as humanity discovered more. Finally, and perhaps crucially, he proclaims an answer to perhaps the most fundamental challenge to the rationalism of the imperial truth. The Warp The Warp the Immaterium, the Empyrean. A myriad of different names exists for the reality, or rather, unreality, that exists in tandem to our own. It is a dimension of pure, formless energy. Energy that is harnessed in our universe by those beings we have come to term psychers. An energy which quantifiably and measurably responds to sentient emotion and thought formed within our universe. It is also the means by which humanity is capable of solving the issue of faster-than-light space travel, as, by means of utilizing the warp drive, human ships may enter the dimension and emerge elsewhere, navigating the roiling tides of psychic energy as mariners of old did the watery oceans of old Earth. And, within the warp, there are demons. We of the modern age use the word, well, loosely. In the era of the Imperial Truth, they were regarded as predatory Xenos beings, as Gundy put it. Uniquely vicious, uniquely poorly understood, but Xenos nonetheless. Aliens of energy, not flesh and blood. Their existence was not denied by the Imperium, not per se, but neither was it widely known. The remembrances of Garvia Loken, former 10th Company Captain of the 16th Legion Luna Wolves, speak of an incident involving the entity Samus, and his subsequent debriefing at the hands of his Primarch, Horus Lupercal. The future War Master enlightened his Astartes subordinate to the nature of the enemy that he faced. Call it a spirit. Call it a demon. We use these words, alien and xenos, to describe the inhuman filth that we encounter in some locales. The creatures of the warp are just aliens too, but they are not life forms as we understand them. They are not organic, they are extra dimensional, and they influence our reality in ways that seem sorcerous to us, supernatural, if you will. So, let's use all the last words for them. Demons, spirits, possessors, changelings, all we need to remember is that there are no gods out there in the darkness, no great demons and ministers of evil. There is no fundamental immutable evil in the cosmos. It is too large and sterile for such melodrama. There are simply inhuman beings to oppose us, things we were created to battle and destroy. Orcs, Gaikan, Tshepta, Chilicad, Eldar, Jokero, and the creatures of the warp who are stronger than all of them for they exhibit powers that are bizarre to us because of the otherness of their nature. While it is not beyond me, this horrid irony of using the words of the arch-traitor himself to illustrate the foundational imperial philosophy, 
They are, and yet are, entirely appropriate, and indeed an illustration of how little the broader Imperium was aware of the threat within the warp. If a captain in the most paramount of the Legionia's Astartes was unaware of the nature of the beings within the Immaterium, what could the majority of the Imperium's population possibly know of them? Why were they not informed? Because the Imperial truth was a lie. The galactic and metaphysical conflagration that was the Horus Heresy put paid to this the Emperor's lie, as the warp bled into real space and usurped the fundamental foundations of all that is. Nine legions of the Emperor's space marines, nine Primarchs, the Emperor's sons themselves, fell to corruption vilest and most total, pledging servitude to the dreaded sentiences within the depths of the Immaterium, that darkest of pantheons that name themselves the gods of chaos. The primordial annihilator, a concept, an energy, an ununiversal truth in and of itself. It is the great destroyer, the unmaker from outside of all things. It crushes logic, reason, universal laws, warping them all to clay to be sculpted by its vilest, multifarious appendages. Gods exist, and they are fouler than anything we could have ever imagined. Or do they? Is the Emperor's truth really the Emperor's lie? Is the reality of the universe, that gods and demons, the supernatural, the unknown, the ephemeral, do in fact exist? Did the Master of Mankind actually hide this from us, lie to his species, about the fundamental truth of all things? Truth. There is that word again. One thing must be made clear here. The Emperor, beloved by all, hallowed upon the throne, saviour of mankind, denied his followers, even his Primarch sons, access to the full knowledge of the cosmic system they were sent forth to conquer in his name. His motives, well, you may ask why, but it would be almost ludicrous to assume them. We can infer, debate even, Though the knowledge of this very thing is so torturously secreted from the Imperium that this very record itself teeters on the brink of heresy most total. That the Emperor was completely aware of the hypocrisy inherent in the name of his philosophy, let alone the concept, is beyond doubt. And that he extended his knowledge to those he deemed either worthy of it or necessary within his plans is also beyond doubt. Malkador, for one. The entirety of the Legio Custodes, his marvellous life woods. Sundry other imperial organisations of much more specialised natures likely too had knowledge of the true nature of things. The Order Elucidatum, the Sisters of Silence, the Ordo Sinister, all owed their existence to combating or suppressing existential level threats, artefacts, psychana, history, concepts from the unholy beyond. That he did not choose to illuminate his sons is perhaps a subject so complex it will need its own record, but what all this reveals must be acknowledged before we proceed further. The Emperor knew, and the Emperor lied. Or rather, as one prefers to see it, he did not reveal the entire truth. Now, I imagine at this point there are some amongst you who are beginning to, well, question. <laughs> The Emperor lied to you. You feel this within your hearts. You are attempting to deny all that it is making you feel. For is it not anger towards him? And is that not the vilest sin? Marking you for death? Is he not our God Emperor? Our most holy saviour? Our destiny incarnated? Fear not. He, as he has always been, was possessed of the most ardent surety that his path was indeed the correct one. What other explanation is there? He knew of his hypocrisy, but he persisted. To have concealed the truth of the warp from so many, even in an age of grandest enlightenment, must have only been the hardest of decisions, and one not made lightly in the least. But again, you no doubt cry, why? Any discussion of the Immaterium is inherently a difficult and dangerous one, for it in and of itself is not a place that lends itself to definition. No rational mind can fully shape, form, or contain the knowledge of it properly, 
for it itself is an ever-changing cascade of purest unreality. When discussing such things, one inevitably trends towards allegory, using crude metaphors in an attempt to deliver an approximation of an understanding, simile fragments of a greater truth. But what we do know is that the warp is alive. Not alive in the sense of biology as we know it, but rather it is a pure energy, possessed of self-awareness, a sentience all of its own. That sentience is a reflection of the dreams, hopes, fears, wants, loves, hatreds, desires, all of the myriad of emotions that all sentient life in our universe feels. It is an ocean, and into that ocean we pour our thoughts, and in those vast tide of passions, intelligences emerge. The War Master's analogy is not entirely without justification, nor was Gundy's avowal that these intelligences are simply xenos of an altogether more unknowable quality, but to compare the demon to the orc is fundamentally impossible. An orc is a thing of hateable flesh, the demon is purest energy. While both are predatory, the demon uniquely is so, stalking sentient life from beyond the skein of reality itself, seeking means through which it can inveigle its way into our world. Once it is capable of doing so, its manifestation presents itself by accumulating all material around us, both real and psychic, to invariably clothe itself in whatever it may to inspire horror. Their scent, movements, utterances, even their very presence, proclaim their otherness, invaders to this plane. But as terrible as these lesser emanations are, they are but fragments of a greater and more cyclopean whole. As one has discussed previously in one's discourse upon the nature of the archenemy, over time, the intelligences of the warp began to reflect fundamental pillars of the nature of all sentient life, and for whatever reason, whatever dark jest our universe has played upon us, they are fundamentally negative. War and bloodshed, disease and decay, desire and ambition, mutation and change. The warp is a mirror, and we, by our existence, give it life. The intelligences within it seek to increase their hold over us, to wield our emotions for their benefit. The more we feel, and the stronger we feel it, the greater they swell in power. The more blood is shed and bones broken, the greater waxes the lord of war. The more that health is usurped and plagues ravage the land, the greater waxes the lord of decay. The more humans strive for impossible perfection, or plumb the depths of depravity, the greater waxes the lord of excess. The more we seek power to manipulate our own destinies, the greater waxes the lord of change. And should any of these be carried out deliberately in their name, oh, yet greater do they swell. Belief is their truest sustenance. They crave it beyond anything else, for it nourishes them beyond simpler, unaligned emotions. These greater intelligences and the lesser creatures in their thrall, they are stories rendered alive. They are self-aware concepts, as if the laws of physics in this plane could be personified and treated with. Innumerable, infinite shards of the same simple fictions. Predatory legends given form by our simple belief in what we feel. They are what we make them. How does one combat an idea? What happens when concepts themselves are the enemy? What is one to do when every iota of belief in the supernatural, direct or indirect, feeds the primordial annihilator? Starve them. Cut them off from what sustains them. Deny them succor and watch the dreadful power of the warp wane as reality simply forgets it is there. Well, would that it were so simple. If one had to hazard the broadest of guesses, the Imperial Truth was an attempt by the Emperor to weaken the connection between this terraqueous realm of ours and deny the arch enemy its source of power. By weakening the hold of faith and the supernatural upon the human mind, he may have sought to starve his foes and shepherd humanity away from a time when the terrible darkness of the night caused us to cry out for the aid of the ephemeral. For beyond our ken, the ephemeral was hungrily watching.
Though many of us had no way of knowing, our beliefs fed things greater and more terrible than imagination. And in horrid retrospect, many did so willingly, bargaining for the power of the warp in exchange for servitude at the feet of the dark pantheon. Superstition, religion, faith, all form the easiest pathways by which the demonic other may crack the skein, eliciting its tendrils into the hearts and minds of humans and making way for its apotheosis. By suppressing, violently if needs be, all knowledge of the immaterium and the wielding of it beyond the most surface level understanding, was the Emperor and those within his innermost circle seeking through ignorance to bring an enlightenment. What scant writings we have of his closest servants speak of it in such tones. Malkador the Sigilite, in conversation with 5th Legion Primarch Jagatai Khan, spoke of it as the ultimate of necessities, the purest and most truest deception, but a temporary measure meant to buy the Imperium vital time in an almost impossibly short span. We of the present, those of us who even know that the Imperial Truth was once the most perfect wit, can only look at what has come of it and decide. If it truly were a shield made of benighted ignorance that styled itself as the Sword of Enlightenment, then the Imperial Truth could only ever have been as the Sigilite said, an impermanent solution to a problem on a universal scale. Certainly, there seems to have been much, much more at play and more pieces upon the board than even I may yet can. The Emperor's, as yet to me unexplained absence from the Great Crusade during its final years, scattered references to a seemingly endless stream of men, materials, and magi disappearing into the depths of the Imperial dungeons even as the Warmaster's hordes rampaged across the stars, all speak to a great plan that is beyond what records available, even those to the Logos Historica Vertia, can surmise. Perhaps through his colossal psychic might, he was building some greater work than even the Imperium. <laughs> this bears further and deeper investigation, not this speculation. What then do we ultimately arrive at as a conclusion upon the Imperial truth itself? Was it the great lie that some of my colleagues decry it as? Are gods real? Does the supernatural underpin all of reality itself? As hard as this is for one to say, the truth may be yes and no. That this universe we exist in is stranger and altogether more malignant and cruel is a very real thing. Its self-aware state cannot be denied, for we saw the heresy, we saw the scouring, and now we see the opening of the eye and the birth of the Great Rift, and every day more and more and more of the never-born things from beyond the veil hammer at the walls of our petty reality. Faith is the order upon which the Imperium turns, faith in the God Emperor and his angels of death, and to deny his divinity is to literally court one's own death. He has truly ascended a being now of psychic energy, a godhead in his own right. But does this in and of itself ultimately violate the imperial truth as a concept? What is the warp but energy? The miracles we see performed before our very eyes, which have come to define the Imperium itself, could they not simply be the manifestation of a greater universal system? and that in our ongoing psychic awakening, humanity is discovering the malleability of reality under the sheer power of belief. The immaterium and the materium are indelibly bound, two sides of the same coin, each capable of harnessing and wielding the forces of the other to gain immense power. Is this not, then, how the universe operates? Is this not, then, ultimately, facet of scientific truth, albeit one that stretches simply too far into the unknowable, that we simply cannot quite grasp it at present. Within this macro structure of fleeting concepts that we have decided collectively to term reality, it has become apparent since the earliest days of the Imperium 
that all things are a matter of belief. It does not matter whether this belief springs from reason or faith. Ultimately, your truth, that one that lives inside you, can shape the foundations of this universe, if you believe in it hard enough. You may even bring others into your fold, your truth supplanting theirs, on and on, until, somewhere, beyond the walls of our conceptual framework, something opens its eyes and fixes you within its gaze. It is at this point you will find out just how small and horribly, atrociously important that belief of yours really was. Ave Imperator. Gloria in excelsis terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.